Stefano, who's worked on all sorts of great stuff. He started his career very young on the show. He's since worked on stuff, including the Venture Brothers, Paul Riddish's wonderful new Mickey Mouse shorts, uh, Story Call with the Rauch Brothers, who we had on the podcast earlier this year. Uh, he's worked with Gendy Tartakovsky. He does comics. He does graphic novels. A really fantastic body of work. And on Ren and Stimpy, he did a whole bunch of stuff from backgrounds to story art to layouts, and that's all go into. He'd come back to the show pretty much throughout its entire run. So let's hear from Stephen. Sort of roughly, whereabouts in the show's run were you brought on board? It was quite early on, wasn't it? I was actually brought on, I guess uh, it was technically for season three. Uh, season two, I'm sorry. Um, I was, yeah, uh, the first six were done. Um, they went really well, and then, you know, um, they were calling the next, the next go-round, season two, and so Bill Ray was, uh, you know, there from the beginning, and, um, or pretty close to the beginning, and I knew Bill from DC Comics, and uh, from when he lived in New York. And he called me and he said, you know, they're looking for talent. They're, they're just open to portfolios right now. Um, John wants to expand. Spumco's going to get bigger. they got a lot more cartoons to do. They need a lot more talent. And do you want to submit a portfolio? And so at that point, I realized, I mean, I grew up drawing comic books. You know, when I was a little kid, I thought I was going to draw Batman. But, you know, by the time I was 20, I realized that was never going to happen. And that really, that wasn't my talent anyway. I, I was much better at, at humor. And drawing humor in comics means that you don't make any living at all. But I always loved animation. I always thought I'd wanted to get into animation. And this seemed like a perfect opportunity. I didn't really know the show. By that point, I might have seen a little bit of it, but I just was not watching cartoons at that point. So I was sort of aware of it because it was getting culturally big. But um, I figured, well, yeah, okay, let me let me submit my portfolio, and I did. It was a pretty ragtag portfolio, but it was mostly comic book stuff and licensing stuff that I'd, I'd been doing. I'd drawn a lot of Mickey Mouse, and I'd drawn a lot of Bugs Bunny, and I'd drawn a lot of Popeye licensing by then, and um, I guess, you know, John liked enough what he saw. I was had the feeling that he wanted to, he, he thought, like, I'd be useful someday to expand into, oh, he'd be good for licensing, oh, he'd be good if we did comic books, and I, I always got the feeling I was, I was hired because of that. So, yeah, and so I was, I was hired. I was, uh, I got a call from Libby Simon, who was the producer at the time, and I was told I would be a board artist. I was told I'd be a, I'd be a storyboard artist, and so that's. Um, and then you know I planned to move out to LA, and because I was living in New York at the time, and where I grew up, and I moved out to LA. So were you storyboarding from the beginning, or was it more sort of layouts to begin with? I was I was nowhere near boards <laughs> right. when, I, when I got there. <laughs> I understood that I was hired as a board artist, and you know it was. I mean, looking back, it was certainly, you know, better that I was not boarding right away. Um, I did a lot of things, actually. My first job, when I first got there, I was I was a background designer. Uh, they put me in the basement <laughs> at Spumco, where there was no one else, except, I think, Doyle, who was doing the animatics in another part of the basement. But, yeah, I was, I was in the basement by myself. And Bob Camp came downstairs and he said, I got backgrounds. I need backgrounds for my cartoon. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing uh, In the Army. And like, you know, I, I don't do any of that fancy shit that John does. I'm just doing, you know, down and dirty cartoons. I got to get it done. And I was like, okay, yeah, I could draw backgrounds because, you know, I could, I drew comic books. I could draw, I could draw whatever you needed. So, yeah, for the first week, two, couple weeks. Um, I was a background designer, and then I was told that I was going to become Mike Fontanelli's assistant uh, on layout. So they moved me from the basement upstairs into Mike's office, and boy, that, that place was so ramshackle. It was just, it was falling apart. But um, yeah, so then for the next couple months, I was Mike Fontanelli's assistant. Um, and that was a tremendous education because I'd never, I didn't know anything about, uh, layout. I'd never done any sort of animation before. And so it was extremely hard. It's to this day, I still use what I learned, um, from Mike and I never want to do layout again. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really hard. It's much too hard for me. 
But I still do, you know, when I did boards, when I eventually got to do boards, I did pose to pose and I did, you know, and expressions and all that kind of stuff. It was really integral. Um, acting was integral to, to layout. I mean, also, it, you know, layout is, it's a lot of, well, your volumes are changing. Well, why did the character slide suddenly? Well, you know, it's a lot of pinning down stuff, which is much too technical for me because I'm just a stupid um, comic book artist. But, um, but yeah, it was a tremendous education. And then, like a month or two after that, Mike said, you know, you should be, everybody in the studio was bringing their backgrounds to me to, to draw. Not everybody, but a lot of layout artists were bringing their backgrounds to me to draw because I happily drew backgrounds. I, I, it was the one thing I felt confident there. I didn't feel confident drawing the characters. I didn't feel confident having the characters move. But like, yeah, you want a background? I could draw a background. And at some point, Mike said, you know, you should just be the background designer. Nobody here wants to be the background designer. Why don't you be the background designer? And so, you know, uh, I, so I became a background designer. I was, I was the head I was the only background designer under John uh, at Spunko, and um, yeah, that lasted for another month or two, and and I had enough of that, and then I, and then I split. Hmm. At that point, would Bill Ray and Scott Wills were they ever doing like backgrounds as well? Yeah, I mean, Bill and Scott and Glenn Barr were the were the background painters, and so they needed someone. Um, all of them, I'm sure, Glenn, all of them, really, were, were uh, you know, qualified to design the backgrounds, but, um, but they were painting, uh, so they needed someone uh, as the between um, from layout to, uh, to paint, to actually draw the things. So I, I was that person, and, you know, and then, you know, I did, I did my stuff, and I was still learning at the time. I mean, it was pretty difficult, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I wasn't really able to give John what he wanted, and I wasn't... Bob was a little easier to please, thankfully, but um, it, was, it was a pretty difficult go. But, yeah, I was, I was the between guy. I was the guy that drew the stuff, and then Bill and Scott, and Glenn for a while. Glenn left early on too but um yeah the, they they painted my stuff and they made they made the stuff really sing just to clarify a point you made uh, just before that you said you you left yeah spunko was a difficult place for me i um i had never worked in an animation studio before i started my career as a teenager and comic books which means i sat in my mom's basement and then later on my own apartment by myself for years drawing comic books and so i was very much used to being alone so being being in a studio environment was very new to me, and Spunka was a very particular studio. <laughs> it was um, unlike any studio I think I'd ever been in since, because I've been in a lot since then. And so it was a little overwhelming for me. I was, I was kind of underqualified and overwhelmed, and um, it wasn't a good fit, uh, particularly at Spunko. Um, by that point, I really liked the characters, and I liked a lot of the people there. And but uh, I was I was just not at all happy. Um, you know, I'd moved three thousand miles. I don't know where the hell I was. All kinds of stuff. I was young. I was stupid. So I you know I thought like I'm not happy here. I'm just gonna you know. And I, I really didn't. It was clear to me John was not happy with what I was doing. So I thought this is ridiculous. I'm not going to stay in this situation. I mean, I've been I've been making a living you know on my own drawing comic books uh, or. Or whatever, I'll just go back to that. And so, yeah, after I think it was about four months. It might have been a little bit longer, but I feel like it was about four months that I, I was at Spumco. And then, yeah, I just went back to drawing comic books. I quit. I went back to drawing comic books, living in L.A., and then and doing licensing. I always had a lot of Popeye the Sailor work. Uh, by that point, that was, that was a big bread and butter thing. And then two months after that, you know, John was fired. Nick took the show over. So that was a big thing. And, you know, suddenly I was getting a call from Bill Ray and Bob Camp and they were saying, you know, come on in. We, we still we still need you. We still we still need a background designer if you want to be the background designer. And I, you know, I love to learn. It's, you know, if I'm not learning, I'm not happy. But it was really, really extremely difficult for me to learn at Spumco, uh, particularly under John. I was just not used to or comfortable with the way John was comfortable with teaching. But I was very comfortable with the way uh, Bill and Bob in particular, um, and some others, uh, Chris Riccardi, I, I was very comfortable with the way they, were, they taught. I could learn from them. And so I was happy to go back to, to Ren and Stimpy. And I went back with the idea that someday I'd be, I would be that board artist that I moved out to L.A. to be. 
and eventually I was. It took a little while. Um, maybe um, I think we finished up season two, and then there was a little bit of a down period. And then when I went back, yeah, I I negotiated to be a board artist for season three, and that's that's when I started boarding. And one of the things I really enjoyed about uh, Thad's book was the sort of explanations of why or how certain episodes looked a certain way. There were some really quite nice breakdowns of like episodes and the talent involved and then like episodes that were started and then finished after John Kay was fired. So right. they were these kind of like patchworks of, of something that he began and then other people sort of came on and finished. Certainly, I, it always seemed like they were successful at just uh -huh. watching it as a show. There was definitely a sense that, you know, the show was going under a sort of new look. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Ren's voice obviously was different. But going back after John K was fired, what would yeah. you say were the major changes uh, in, like, how, A, the production was run, and B, like, the attitude that Nickelodeon had toward the show as a whole? Well, yeah. I've been on a couple of productions like this. Um, I mean, you know, John John was Ren and Stimpy at, at Spumco, um, and nothing happened uh, without John, except unless it was on one of Bob's cartoons. And I guess Vincent also had some um, had some leeway too to get his his cartoons done. But uh, but I think Bob was the B unit, and Bob got to do whatever you know he needed to do to get cartoons out but everything else was if John John had like a million things on his plate and if John couldn't pay attention to a certain thing things didn't get done uh, and then we Nickelodeon formed a studio around us you know and um, it was like right now you guys deliver and so it was all about delivery I feel like we were still gung-ho to make really good cartoons that we were given uh, a certain amount of leeway to make good cartoons looking back but yeah, our, our thing, and I think we all agreed, like, you know, we wanted to deliver. We wanted to produce. We wanted to make stuff. We didn't want to sit around, from my point of view, um, to either get depleted or to wait for perfection to happen. We we were gung-ho to to deliver. And um, yeah, it was, it was very much um, about let's deliver. Let's, you know, from Nickelodeon and from us, you know, where are the cartoons? We're producing the cartoons. That, that was the agreement, I think, between uh, the games artists and Nickelodeon. I think that was the major difference. There were just no holdups. I mean, there were still a lot of big personalities of games. <laughs> and um, there was some drama, too. But everything was about getting it done. Uh, and I personally, you know, I, back then that would have been a dirty thing to say. But, you know, I'm an older person now. And, you know, I like when things get done. You know, we were not waiting for perfection. We tried to get things as good as we could. Some directors had more leeway to get things more perfect than others, and I think that was great. But they were none. Of, nobody was unreasonable. Everybody wanted to get things done, and um, yeah, we tried to get things done as well as we possibly could. Were you on until like the end? Then throughout the whole rest of the Nickelodeon run? Yeah, I was. Um, my role changed a bit. I think I pulled some sort of dramatic move over. Looking back, there, there's a lot of unnecessary kind of drama. But um, yeah, I got into a kind of a snit <laughs> about what? Which cartoon? Sp S Scotsman in Space, I think. Oh. And it wasn't going to happen the way not just me, but several people thought it was going to happen. Ultimately, it kind of did, but I, I thought it was it was a good opportunity to make a, some sort of political stand, and so I quit um, after Scotsman in Space, and then I quit, and then I did some boards for some other productions in Los Angeles, and then Games called me, or Bob called me, or someone called me and said, hey, we got this really good story, do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, okay. And then I was just, I was working till the end of the original series, but I was a freelancer. Um, I don't know why I did stupid things like that. But um, there's a, like I said, there's a whole lot of stupid things that were done in that production. But yeah, I was, to answer your question, I was on till the end of the fifth season. <laughs> in those sort of later episodes, um, one of the things I do remember being brought up from someone who was talking on the DVDs, although it escapes me right now, but they were saying how 
there was a sense that the last few, there was a feeling that, you know, it was more about like getting to the finish line and just making sure the content was delivered. Was, did you ever get that sense when you were on it? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah. I got, I got the business sense. Um, I, I personally, I mean, it became a big production at that point, and they were, uh, I remember offices of people that I'd never seen before. Uh, board artists and directing teams were, like, shipped in from all parts of the United States and all parts of the world, I think. Mm -hmm. And and the with the edict, get this done. And, you know, I do, I do recall that, um, yeah, they were, like I said, I didn't even know who some of these people were and they were, they were working on specific episodes and, um, I'm not, I'm not even sure I've ever seen them, but uh, the, those episodes, but, uh, but yeah, there, there was like this, this, uh, big push, like my feeling was that, uh, you know, cause I might not have been there to see the day to day operation, but I feel like when, when I visited stuff, like I got the feeling like, yeah, they, things just needed to get done. I do recall people were pretty tired by that point too. Last couple cartoons. Um, cause by that point I, I was doing everything practically, uh, not everything, but I, um, but I was still designing backgrounds and I was still boarding and I was cleaning up boards and I was cleaning up layout animation and, um, I was all over the place and I was helping Bob on a lot of things. Everybody was just helping everybody else, but there were still specific directors and Bob was just exhausted. He was like producing cartoons out of his garage and, you know, he, he it was practically like he had nothing left. It was amazing. There was a lot of fairly heroic maneuvers <laughs> by, by the end, I think. Thankfully, the individual artists, the individual directors, um, you know, they, they have their own specific deals and um, Bob probably took a long time. I can't remember what his last cartoon was. I remember it was being pretty funny. Stimpy's Scooter or something. Um, but yeah, yeah, there was still some good stuff done right up to the end, I think. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned uh, Scotsman in Space. And I remember that one as a kid, finding it quite endearing. I could, it, was, it was one of the perhaps idiosyncratic episodes in the sense that it was very frenetic, very frantic. Very uh -huh. kind of, a lot of ideas that kind of led to other ideas. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, my memory of it is like it was, they had released it uh, on a VHS alongside the space one that John Chris Felicity had done. Oh, really? I think it was all the ones with their space adventurers. And so okay. there's like three or four episodes that are Spumco style Ren and Stimpy's. And then all of a sudden it's like three, four years later and there's this one and such a, a cosmic disparity between... Uh -huh what the show was, you know, from one era to another, which I always rather liked. But I do, I did find myself kind of weirdly drawn to the ones that were kind of, I don't know, calamitous, I guess, in a good uh -huh. way. There was something quite appealing about that, or the ones that were sort of troubling, that we kind of, you'd walk away as, it, you know, you'd have this kind of crisis <laughs> a little bit. It's hard, it's hard to explain, I think, but like... Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think I understand what you mean. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, I like, I like things that are unsettling. I, I like things that are, leave you confused and bewildered and, and depleted. Uh, first time I saw Harvey Kurtzman's art, I was like, I don't know what this is, but, but it's upsetting me. And to this day, I still love that. <laughs> I still love that <laughs> aspect to it. And um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of half-baked stuff, particularly, it seems, that I boarded. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like Scotsman in Space, there was a very concerted effort to make that unsettling and uneven and uh, kind of not making sense and that's part of what I quit about we had a very big meeting with the Nickelodeon executives and Bob and Jim Gomez and I talking with them which was probably not a great idea to retain that feeling about that cartoon I think it did I don't remember anything big coming from that meeting but um but yeah so that was one of the cartoons that kind of settled itself I can imagine so many of them would have been a lot of fun as far as the layout goes, like and the design side of things, putting the story to one side, even like, and also like I, I mentioned earlier, like the overall effect I feel like a lot of those shows have had on how a lot of animation shows, sort of for kids and teenagers, sort of in the late '90s and up till 
quite recently were structured and laid out. Um, yeah. And the approach, I think, to editing and, and pacing and stuff like that, like, it really seemed to kind of set a tone, that, like, sort of era of the show. My th kind of theory about Ren and Stimpy, it sort of feels a bit like the Twin Peaks of animation in that it was... It had its issues, and then, but it really paved the way for a lot of shows to kind of then pick up a certain approach to structure and gags and things like that. Right. But all of the kind of mistakes have been made. Uh -huh. So then, you know, so with Twin Peaks, which was, I, I feel, a very patchy show, but I enjoy elements of it. But then you get stuff like The Sopranos years later. Right. And I think Ren and Stimpy kind of paved the way for a lot of stuff. I'm not sure if this if, if this is his attitude about it, but like a lot of Gendy Tartakovsky stuff on some level, mm -hmm. it feels like he kind of stepped in and, and really sort of embraced a lot of the positives and a lot of the practical elements of design and character development and episode structure and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. I mean, a lot of those guys, um, like Gendy and Paul Rudish and Craig McCracken, you know, these, these were the guys who were uh, in CalArts or just graduating CalArts and seeing their friends work on Ren and Stimpy, guys like Chris Mitchell and Don Shank, went to school with those guys, Gendy and, and uh, Paul Rudish and stuff. And so I think, yeah, I think um, Ren and Stippy was a kind of a thing that kind of went along with their idea of what cartoons were. So I think the guys, the CalArts guys who graduated and sort of formed Cartoon Network or Cartoon Network was formed around them. I mean, you'd have to talk to those guys, obviously, but I do, I do think like there was, uh, there was a big influence. I think SpongeBob is kind of a child, much more successful child, and a much, and I think a much better figured out child of, uh, a much more grounded child of Ren and Stimpy. But still, you know, I, you know, for what what SpongeBob stuff I have done, I use my Ren and Stimpy muscles on that. You know, these days I work on one of my jobs is uh, working on uh, the Mickey Mouse shorts uh, for for Disney, and Paul Rudish is the director producer, and I feel like my my Ren and Stimpy experience still plays into that which is crazy it's 20 years later but um or 25 20 years later but yeah there's still that uh, influence going on I, you know I think with John and Bob and Jim Gomez and Jim Smith wanted to do were regurgitate Tex Avery and Bob Clampett cartoons for a new generation and they did it in a way that made sense to them you know, and I think it changed and informed everything after that. And I think people are still doing sort of Tex Avery, Bob Clampett gags, but it filtered through Ren and Stimpy because that's what popularized it again for the for the last twenty years. Uh, mm. That's that's the way I feel about it. I, w I did really enjoy the um, the overall approach that those Mickey Mouse shorts sort of took, like kind of marrying the older design era of Mickey Mouse with the kind of newer animation sensibilities. Yeah. I thought that was a very watchable end result. And I, I, I don't know if there was any sort of resistance to it, but I remember like, you know, whenever like a new iteration of a classic character comes out, I think like whenever someone tries to redesign Looney Tunes, like they get a lot of flack. Yeah. But I remember finding those like a really nice series of like, not the sort of completely classic Mickey Mouse that everyone knows, but it was something that kids I think could watch. Uh, but it has a nice sort of like, there's a certain intensity to it. Yeah. I guess that I, I definitely felt there was a, a Ren and Stimpy vibe bubbling away somewhere. You know, yeah. There was something that kind of had filtered down into that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, Mickey probably screams more <laughs> mm. in, in these shorts um, than I think he... I don't know if he ever screamed in a Disney short. He probably did, but he, he screams and does takes. I'm sure, you know, he never did a Tex Avery take. If he did, it was very mild in, uh, in you know, any Disney shorts uh, from the classic period, but he does takes continuously now. So, yeah, I think this is just the idea of what cartoons are now. And, uh, you know, Paul was brilliant. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, I'm one of those people who criticizes every time and fetches and, and complains every time Warner Brothers does something new with Bugs Bunny because Bugs Bunny to me was perfected 
in the 40s. But um, yeah, Mickey Mouse was perfected, but Paul is not doing that Mickey Mouse. Paul's doing a different Mickey Mouse. He's adapting the character. He's putting the character in a, in a space that's not uncomfortable. It makes sense. But um, yeah, he's, uh, it's, it's not recreating anything. It's creating something new. I think that's why I don't complain about Paul's Mickeys anyway. <laughs> bugs, bugs, I'll always complain about. <laughs> always. Something that I came across of yours, sort of by chance, was uh, the, the Bill Ray, the Hellboy Jr. Oh. Um, the Wendy and Casper comic in particular. Yep, yep. Which I, uh, I don't know how rather I, I came across that one, but I think I just sort of happened upon it in the shop once. And uh, it's a very interesting book. I really enjoyed that story. Oh. I guess he did. If I remember right, Bill wrote the whole thing, didn't he? Or that is correct. It's like a collection of like little sort of short stories. And do you know sort of how that whole project came about at all? Uh, probably. Bill always seemed to have a fascination with a little hot stuff. Uh-huh. A Harvey character. I remember that going back to Ren and Snippy because, you know, I boarded, I don't think Bill wrote it. Jim Gomez wrote it, but I, there was a short, there was a Ren and Stimpy quote-unquote commercial called Cheese Fist that I boarded, and I designed Cheese Fist, and I, I envisioned him, I think pretty much everybody envisioned him, I think Bill was going to direct that, I think that's how that came about, but I boarded it, Jim Gomez wrote it, and I, I designed the character, and I thought, oh, he's probably just going to be this white, milky character, and Bill immediately made the character red, because Bill was directing, and Bill was also color, color designing the entire little short, and, um, yeah, Bill and I got into a fight about that. Or Bill cursed me out, which he was very upset about afterwards. I will say he was extremely, he was extremely sorry to me that, uh, that he cursed me out. Um, because I said, you can't. I said, and I said it very bluntly to him. I said, you can't make the character red. And he said, go f*** yourself. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I think he was trying to recreate Little Hot Stuff with, with Cheese Fist. Little Hot Stuff is a red character. So, uh, anyway, so, yeah, so he had a connection to Mike Mignola, and he pitched this idea, and then he asked me to work on it, and I don't know if he pitched Wind Wheezy, the sick little witch, to me, or I said I'd like to draw Wheezy. I don't know what which one it was, but it was his character. And I thought, yeah, this will be funny, and I, you know, I just thought you were supposed to draw it in this Harvey Comics style, because I thought that's what everybody was going to do, and it turns out I was the only one that did it. I was the only one that drew it in a Harvey comic style. But um, yeah, that was a fun. That was a fun story. There's another story. The one that's probably better actually is the second from the second issue, which is Huge Retarded Duck. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Bill wrote that. I, Bill came up with that. And, uh, that I probably drew. I didn't draw so much in the Harvey comic style. That was kind of my Spumco style. It was very kind of Spumco, Ren and Stimpy style. But those, yeah, that's all, that's all Bill. Hmm. So yeah, have you worked alongside any other like Ren and Stimpy artists since the show ended as well as Bill? Well, when Ren and Stimpy ended, uh, I thought, right, I'm just going to move back to New York because I didn't uh, feel like I found my home, my place in Los Angeles. And then Lynn Naylor said, are you going to move back to New York? Because I'm going to work on this Felix the Cat show and I'd like for you to be my assistant director. And I was like, well, I can't move back to New York if I'm going to got the opportunity to be Lynn Naylor's assistant director. So I stayed an extra six months in LA just to work with Lynn. So I worked with Lynn. Who the hell else? I mean, Lynn and Chris Riccardi, um, about 10 years ago, they had a, uh, a pilot for Nickelodeon. It was called The Modifiers. It's a very beautiful cartoon. It's a strikingly beautiful cartoon. Um, I worked on that. What else? Oh, my God. I feel like I work with these guys a lot, but not so much. I work sort of with Bob Camp now. Bob lives in New York now, and he teaches at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. And I, I started teaching the School of Visual Arts as well last year. Um, so I've gotten to see more of Bob than I have in the last 10 years. Bill had a pilot called King Crab that I worked on. That was a while ago. That was 10, 15 years ago. Scott Wills, I guess, quite a bit. Um, I'm on at least three Gendy productions <laughs> right now. And, you know, Gendy's one of those guys. I mean, his, his story is that he blows his conch shell and all his team arrives, you know. 
and I'm I'm fortunate to be one of Gendy's team. Um, I'm I'm either a board cleanup guy or a, or an anchor or or a designer for Gendy, and so um, and Scott Wills is one of those guys. Scott Wills is probably the guy. Scott Wills is. Scott Wills hears the conch shell blow before anybody else because I think Scott has his own conch shell or something. So, so he, that's how important he is to Gendy. So I'm working a lot with Scott Wills uh, in the last several years, um, and he, that's great because Scott's not only one of the horniest people I've ever met, but he's uh, he's easily one of the most talented guys uh, I've ever run across. Um, I run into Vincent Waller every now and then, and Vincent's such a great guy, and Vincent's, Vincent was always one of the most level-headed people I think I've ever met in animation. As we ran into each other at the watching Mad Max, of all things, mm-hmm. last time I was in L.A. So, and we talk, we, we chat occasionally online. You know, I was just thinking today, it's like our generation's Rocky and Bullwinkle, you know. Uh, it's, it's that moment in animation where there was a shift. Um, and you know, Rocky and Bullwinkle wasn't. I, I could really couldn't speak too much about Rocky and Bullwinkle, but it was a, it was a hugely influential show, and um, you know, it changed animation for a while. And I think Ren and Stimpy is one of those shows. And you know, how lucky I was to be on a show that. Uh, I mean, I've been fortunate to be on some really good productions, I think. But um, yeah, Ren and Stimpy was one of those real highlights in my career. I would absolutely have to say. I'm, I'm super proud, I, I, you know, uh, to have been part of that crew. Stephen DiStefano there, and I think you'll want to check out his work at stephendistefano.tumblr.com. He's also on Twitter, at sdestefanosta. So the, one of the other reasons I really wanted to put together this special, because, you know, again, it's not necessarily um, the event of the season, uh, but I've wanted to talk to these people for so many years. Um, it's just finding like a dude excuse to get them all together.